Okay, chapter 5, part 12. We finished in part 11 with the jury instructions um, and some of the things that the judge will charge. Um, and the jury goes out and the first thing that they do is select a four-person who sort of runs the show. Uh, the jury, of course, is sequestered, meaning they're by themselves. Um, during the trial, they were instructed not to discuss the case among themselves until deliberations began. So now they begin deliberating and discussing the case and taking votes. Okay, um, by uh, constitutional law, um, it does not have to be a unanimous decision, so it will depend upon the jurisdiction, although most jurisdictions still require a unanimous verdict. Once they have reached their decision, their verdict, they tell the judge, they're brought back out into the courtroom. Um, the judge then um, has them uh, turn over the verdict or read the verdict, depending upon the jurisdiction. Sometimes the jury uh, four-person reads it, sometimes the judge reads it, sometimes the clerk of the court reads it. Okay. Um, the lawyers are given a chance to object to the form of the verdict, um, and then uh, that uh, ends that part of it. Um, now, um, at that point, the, the lawyers can make motions um, post uh judgment motions. Uh, so they're asking the judge at this point to ignore the decision of the jury. Um, the typical motion is called a judgment notwithstanding the verdict or a JNOV um, and that is where the lawyer says to the judge the jury could not have legally reached this conclusion. You have to reverse it and rule the opposite way. Very rarely, rarely, rarely happens. Okay, um, the judge then uh, takes the verdict um, and puts it into the form of a written order. Um, in most civil cases, there's going to be uh, damages awarded because that's usually what people are seeking. Um, in uh, uh, then um, the uh, usually when you're asking the judge to set aside the uh, judgment uh, of the jury, the verdict of the jury. Uh, you're telling the judge that the judge may have committed some error um, and that makes the verdict invalid. Or there's been newly discovered evidence that this was discovered after uh, the presentation of evidence. Um, or that there was some uh, matter of prejudice. For example, it's now been discovered that one of the jurors is related to the other party or whatever. Okay, so those are the common types of errors that are presented to the judge. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so after the judge makes the uh, verdict into a judgment, then either party or both parties can appeal um, in a civil case. All right. So usually the person who loses um, appeals, but sometimes the person who wins appeals because maybe they didn't get as much as they expected. The jury awarded them $25,000 and they thought that they were entitled to $100,000. So both parties may appeal. The person uh, starting the appeal is called the appellant. The person responding to the appeal is called the appellee. The appeal is started by filing a notice of appeal with the clerk's office of the trial court. The clerk's office then composes what we call the record, which consists of all the documents that have been filed in the case, all the exhibits, and a verbatim transcript of the trial and any hearings that were held. Okay, if there is no verbatim transcript because the parties chose not to have one, it's doubtful that they're going to be able to appeal because most of the time the appellate courts won't hear uh, an appeal unless there's a transcript. Okay, so all of this is then sent up to the appellate court. The appellate court then dockets the case um, with the clerk's office of the appellate court then a notice is sent to the appellant um, that the case has been docketed and the appellant has a certain number of days to file their appellate brief. The appellate brief consists generally of two parts. One is what we call the enumeration of errors and the second is the argument and uh, authority. Okay, So the enumeration of errors basically says the court erred in this way, the court erred in this way, the court erred in this way. Okay, and then the argument and citation of authorities basically says this is why the court was wrong in what it did and this is the law that 
shows you why it was wrong. Okay, their brief is then filed with the appellate court, and the opposing side, the appellee, then has a chance to respond to that brief by filing their own written brief. Then, in most jurisdictions, the parties have the option of appearing orally, uh, or appearing personally, before the uh, appellate court to make oral arguments. Um, if they chose to do so, or if it's required in the jurisdiction, then sometime after the briefs have all been filed, they'll get a notice from the court that your case will be heard on a certain day. They then go before the appellate court, which consists of, of, of usually three um, to nine judges, depending upon the jurisdiction, and they will, arguably pre they will orally present their case to the judges, and the judges can ask them questions about their cases. Um, there is no new evidence presented. There's no new trial. The parties to the case do not have to appear. It can be just the lawyers. And the judges just want to hear arguments on the law. Okay. Then the judges make a decision and issue their opinion just like we've talked about before. Okay. So we talked about the notice of appeal. We talked about the transcript and the record. And we talked about the briefs. So when the judges go back to make their decision, they have some options. They can affirm the decision of the trial court, which means that everything stays as it was, uh, and the trial court was right. They can reverse the trial court, say that the trial court made a mistake. When they do that, they have a couple of options. One is they can say, well, this case has to be retried, um, and the error has to be corrected. So we're reversing we're remanding it, which means we're sending it back to the trial court, and we're directing the trial court this time to do it this way. Okay? Um, or they can uh, reverse in part um, and remand in part. Or they can um, re reverse the entire case and enter a new order and not send it back uh, to the trial court. Or they can simply modify the trial court's order. For example, uh, the trial court jury awarded $10 million. They can say that that was excessive as a matter of law. Um, we're not going to reverse the decision, except we're going to lower the damages to $1.5 million. Okay, so those are some of the options that the appellate court has. Okay, so if you've got a final judgment and it's been appealed and um, affirmed, or if it's not appealed, then you're going to try and get your money because you got awarded damages. So if you're lucky, the defendant or the insurance company is going to whip out a checkbook and write you a check, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Um, that doesn't always happen. So what do you do to collect your judgment? There are various ways that we'll be talking about in a future chapter. Um, one way that's mentioned here in the textbook is what's called a writ of execution. Or in Georgia, it's called a FIFA. Uh, which is a Latin phrase, okay? And what that is, is it's an order that you get from the judge ordering the sheriff to seize property owned by the defendant, the obligated party, um, to sell that property at a public sale and to turn over the proceeds um, up to the amount that was owed to the party that the money was owed to, okay? Um, so... One of the considerations when you file a lawsuit, um, I think we talked about this before, is is there insurance or is the defendant capable of paying a judgment um, either in cash or in property? If not, you may not want to even bring the lawsuit. Okay, that finishes um, Chapter 5.